Good evening, or whatever time of day it is for you where you are. Uh, we're in uh, London time, I am, and um, my challenge today uh, for you and for me together is trying to do this uh, topic called earnings per share, where we hope to cover things that might come up in the MCQs, multiple choice questions, could come up as part of ratios, which is really why I'm starting this topic today, ratio analysis, interpretation, and of course the most likely area is always going to be published accounts. Okay, so that's the reason why we're doing it. It has three areas of the exam paper. It turns up in frequently. Okay, so that's the, that's the area. Uh, welcome to Yinka, to Lisa, Hello, uh, Yinka again. I wonder if he's going to come in like a rock star. Wow, who is that? I don't know who you're talking about. The, the um, earnings per share is one of those wonderful, wonderful, wonderful topics where I have to be honest with you, when I was a student all those years ago, uh, my lecturer on an evening course, I used to work during the day and I used to go to evening lectures, the fellow who did the evening lecture, he explained the earnings per share so clearly that I thought I will never be afraid of this topic again. And all these years later, I hope to communicate that to you. And any, if you f feel that I'm explaining it well, that lecture takes the credit. So I've added a couple of little tricks of my own. Okay. But the nice thing about it is it's uh, an area that is very manageable uh, by any student who's prepared a little bit. Though in the real exam, in the actual exam, something like 50% of students don't even attempt it. And of the 50% who do attempt it, many of them get it wrong. So it's one of those things that's done really badly, um, but I'll show you how to do it. Okay, there are basically five kinds of earnings per share, and one of them is a silly one, takes 10 minutes to do, five minutes, but then there are four big kinds of earnings per share. Okay, so I want you to go away from these first, say, one and a half hours to let the uh, earnings per share, just to feel relaxed about it, no problem, give me the earnings per share, I'm waiting for it in the exam. That's the feeling, okay. Um, as I say, it's coming up regularly these, day, these days all over the place, and uh, I want you to feel relaxed about it. For the last 20 minutes, half an hour or so, I see how the time goes, I would like to get deeper into interpretation, and I'd like to show you an examiner's, our examiner's article. Yes, an article by our examiner, uh, what, uh, what uh, interpretation is all about. And in that article, you'll see him mentioning things like earnings per share. So that is the plan for today. Okay, a lovely topic, comes up regularly, done badly by most people, but not by you. And that's my big hope. Okay, so let's make a start, therefore. <clears throat> if I can take you into the program for the day. Uh, I see you just once more after today and then with a bit of a gap I'll then see you on revision so please make sure you can come on revision because that's where we mix all these topics and I'll be doing a huge publish accounts question with a bit of earnings per share attached so that's when we get a chance to mix lots and lots of topics and where your skill level goes up to another you know um, <coughs> much higher uh, skill displayed so this is the program what I was thinking of on the train going home last night, um, why don't I, when I was looking at this program, <coughs> excuse me, why don't I, where possible, have a look at the homework as well in class called diluted earnings per share. Okay. So we have there uh, five exercises, as you can see. Uh, and I'm going to do the diluted in class because the diluted has been coming up regularly under um, the MCQs, multiple choice questions. And as you know, the main stress of this exam are all these little MCQs that come up on all kinds of strange topics. So that's the plan. Now I need to execute the plan. All right, and then as time goes on for the last few minutes, uh, as I say, I'll have a little read of the examiner's article and get you started on the question called Tesbury. But when I see you next time, I will finish Tesbury. Uh, can I just make sure that when you come in next time, please bring in pages 
494 to 499, we'll have them accessible to you uh, if you're the type who only looks at the main part of the notes. But towards the end of the answers to uh, the class notes, I've done some about five, six pages of a detailed answer to test three. I need that next time, so don't miss that, okay? So that's the plan. Now let's see if I can um, get something going with this. Would the class revision and the online revision be exactly the same? Now, what is class revision? Uh, sorry, Yinka, I missed your question. The, um, would the class revision and... So what happens online revision, we have four sessions of two and a half hours each. But if you come to the classroom, we have four days of nearly six hours each day, or five and three quarters, so it's obviously double the time. But then we have four days, whereas the online revision is more like the equivalent of, well, it's 10 hours. So that's the, that's the difference. So I would suggest, if at all possible, if you can come to see me in class, I would love to see you, Yinka, and uh, <coughs> get a little bit more done. But obviously, when you're doing online, there's so many other subjects that have to share time, etc. So it's a little bit more difficult to fit in a four-day course. But that's, that's on the, um, in the classroom. That's the difference between the two. Okay. All right, though the questions I'll be doing on the um, online revision will be equivalent to a two-day course. All right, so the same questions. Right, where are we? Class notes. I thought I'd take you into earnings per share and page 265, okay? Page 265. Uh, this is IS, one of those lovely standards, IS 33. You don't have to know all the numbers, but the examiner uses numbers like that. So if you're doing an MCQ, uh, let's say a couple of sittings ago, was it two, three sittings ago, he said, can you do this share option based on IS 33? So the examiner loves to put those numbers in. I don't want you to get a shock in the exam and say, what is he talking about? Just feel relaxed, okay? So earnings per share, IS 33. Uh, I won't go through uh, too much of an introduction because it's mainly a uh, uh, calculation exercise, though you can see there there are different kinds of earnings per share. There's something called basic and there's something called diluted. Basic doesn't mean easy, by the way. Okay, Some of it is easy, but basic means the actual shares that have been issued. So please spend some time reading through the rest of the chapter, just in case you get a chance to use some of those points in a written question. So as I say, very often earnings per share last part of a large published accounts question. So what are we saying? 25 marks, prepare the PL SFP and the SOSI, Statement of Changes in Equity, 25 marks altogether. Last five marks to make it up to 30, hey, do some earnings per share. And most students are struggling with the main question, they never even start the earnings per share. Whereas I would like you to say, not too bad, I can do something here. Okay, because I did study it for an hour and a half or whatever online with me. Okay, so that's what I want you to feel. It's nothing to be afraid of. Possible as an MCQ as well. Done very poorly, as I say, 50% of candidates do not even attempt it sometimes. Which is quite shocking. So what is EPS? Very easy. It's a measure of the interest of each ordinary share of a parent in the performance. So if you underline the word performance, we're talking about interpretation. Okay, interpretation. And the uh, formula is basically earnings. Earnings means profit after tax. Divided by, earnings divided by number of shares. Divided by the shares, number of shares. Not share capital, but the number of shares. And that's it, earnings per share. Beautiful topic, as you can see, nothing technically difficult. I one or two little specialist areas, but the, the definition is so easy. What else can we say? This is arrived at by dividing profit or loss that can be said to belong to the ordinary equity shareholders, the numerator, the thing upstairs, by the weighted average number of shares, outstanding. Now, the word outstanding is some new word they're using. It means issued. All right. And earn, note, earnings is after tax, after non-controlling 
interests, NCIs, if you get a group situation. And EPS, the IAS said you must show it at the end of the PL. And so we come to the actual changes in sh to share capital. I better be careful here. Uh, these are what gives us basic EPS, okay, basic earnings per share. Issue at full market, market value. An issue at full market value involves cash being received by the issuer. Issuer means the company. You see, this has an impact on earnings and consequently a weighted average calculation must be done. Now, let me just see if you understand the, the meaning of the word weighted average. So I'm going to test you with some simple arithmetic, okay? And I want you to answer it and I'll be looking at the answers that come through. Imagine you're a company, so the role we are playing is you are the company, I'm the investor, me and my friends, okay? Now, you are the company and you, you issued to members of the public, who now have become shareholders, at the start of the year, you have already in issue 7 million shares, okay? And then during the year, in the midpoint, exactly in the midpoint of the year, you issue three more million. Okay, so I'll run through that again. From the start of the year till the end of the year, you have one lot of shares issued, seven million in number. And then in the middle of the year, you issue three more million. So what would you say, I'm asking the question now, what would you say is the weighted average number of shares throughout the year? And I look for your answer on the message board, which I'm keeping an eye on. What would you say? What answer would you say? Seven million throughout the year, three million for half a year. So what would the weighted average be for the whole year? Really easy stuff. 8.5, beautiful. So what uh, Yinka has done is the five billion throughout the year, Lovely. And then the three million for half a year multiplied by six twelfths is one and a half. So seven plus one and a half, eight point five. Wonderful. Okay. Now the ability to do stuff like that obviously won't be a big question, but be a part of a question. But well done there. Superb. So whenever you have a full price issue, you're always looking for weighted average calculations. Typical little part of an MCQ, half of an MCQ. Now, the other uh, area that we must look at is this thing called a bonus issue. This goes free, underline free, to existing shareholders. Free to existing shareholders as a reward for their loyalty. Okay, so if, let's say, you're a company, I'm the shareholder. Many years ago, when you issued shares at $1.25, thousands of these shares, me and my friends paid you one dollar and the 25. So the extra 25, as we well know, is held by the company in the share premium account. And you've held, that, held on to that for three years, say, many years. But today, because we are still shareholders, you're saying to us, remember that 25 cents extra you gave us multiplied by so many hundred thousand shares? That big chunk of money we are holding in the company as in the share premium account. Today, we are rewarding you for still being a shareholder, for your loyalty. So we're going to take it out of the share premium account and we're going to put it into the share capital account. It's like simply rewarding me for loyalty. Okay, now that uh, can come out of the share premium account, it can come out of the revaluation account, can come out of the P&L account. Just follow the instructions of each examination question. But that's extremely dangerous bonus issues. Notice there's no cash impact. Do you agree that a long time ago, me and my friends gave you some extra money, but today, when you issue the bonus shares to me, you don't get any new cash to invest. So would you agree, when you do the sums, the earnings per share will be a little bit less than had it been a full price issue? Okay, and that's why when you're doing the uh, EPS for bonus issues, you've got to treat it as if assumed to be issued on the first day of the financial year. 
So when it comes to bonus issues, can I just ask you to write never do weighted average. Never do weighted average. Yet when you're doing full price issue, always do weighted average. Do you notice these are different? You get that? These are different. All right, let's move on to the rights issue. So I'll make all these things come alive by doing past exam questions today with you from the class notes. Rights issues. This gives the existing shareholders, existing shareholders the right to buy new shares at a price lower than market value. Now, long, long time ago, I remember doing a question with you, a couple of weeks ago, was it? Called, uh, what was it called? Llama. And that's page 210 in the class notes. And if I remember right, the full price was something like 160 cents. But the rights issue price was about half price, 80 cents. So what we're saying is rights issues go to existing shareholders, but at half price. Now, why do companies make rights issues? Uh, obviously, they want to raise some new money. So rather than issuing it to members of the public who haven't heard of the company, you might as well direct it to me. I'm already a shareholder. I like your company. I've got my money invested. I'm quite happy that my shares are worth 160 cents. And then you're saying to me, for every four shares that you hold on the rights issue date, I'll give you one share half price. How do you think I'm going to react? My reaction is going to be, yes, I want it, please, definitely. Provided I've got enough money, of course, to, to buy the shares. So it's like, it's like preaching to the converted. I like your company anyway. And if you're giving me some more shares at half price, of course I'll say yes. And the whole process costs less with all these you know, stamp duties and uh, legal costs. It actually costs less. So one advantage of rights issues is you can raise, raise new money without having to incur hu huge amounts of costs. Okay, so there you are, lots and lots of things. Um, a rights issue is said to be a combination of an issue at full price and bonus issue. Okay, so it's like full price and bonus issue rolled into one. The examiner calls it rolled into one. Mixed up into one. Okay, so that's your rights and bonus. Now, the other thing I ought to say, examiner likes this. Examiner likes rights issues. Why is that? Students don't like. And years ago, our examiner, who's been an examiner now for something like 18 years, I think, 17 and a half, 18 years, he's worked out many years ago. Every time he sets earnings per share, half the people can't, don't even attempt it. If he sets rights issue, that, that is even a worse percentage. Okay, so I'm going to show you a technique, because rights issues is the most likely always. Moving on, why standard is required? EPS is important. Today, the statement of profit and loss has probably overtaken the statement of financial position. I think that's a fair comment. If you're looking at my performance, yes, let's say roles are reversed now. Uh, you're an investor, I'm the company. Would you agree you'll be looking at my P&L rather than my balance sheet, my SFP, unless you're a bank and giving me some loans and you want security and all that kind of stuff. But if you're looking at performance, there's only one place to look, P&L. Okay, so what they're saying is within the P&L, which has things like consolidated figures and NCIs and PUPs and who knows what else, all these strange looking items, NCIs and so on, eventually come down to earnings per share. So as a non-accountant, if you imagine me for one second as a non-accountant, uh, if you say to me the earnings per share is so much, I'll say, oh, thanks, because I didn't really understand the whole of the accounts, but I do understand earnings per share. And you're saying to me earnings per share is 50 cents, and I realize my dividend is paid out of earnings per share. So speaking the language, a language that I can understand, that's why we do these earnings per share things. Okay, easy for a non-specialist user to understand. And the other uh, point that I've picked up from the examiner reading some of his answer guides, EPS is a more accurate indication of profitability. 
So you can read the notes. Let me see if I can explain the notes rather than just reading them out. Think of this scenario. Uh, I might even just uh, bring myself a little bit, make it a little bit bigger so I can explain a bit better. What we're saying is the, um, if you say last year have this much earnings and you divide it by this many shares, it's possible that that many earnings divided by the same number of shares, let's say, the answer will be 100 cents. Yes, $1 will say 100 cents, because let's say both figures are the same. That was last year. <coughs> Excuse me. If this year you buy up other companies, other subsidiaries, and uh, that means, especially where they're successful, if you're doing the consolidated earnings, the earnings from that much could well double. You see, and many directors, many chairmen, they only talk about profits, total profits. What they don't say is we had profits of that much last year. These profits, additional profits, are because we bought other companies. You see, they'll say, well, the profits are this much last year. Now they are this much. And people say, wow, that's a good company, well-run company, great directors. I always think that if you measure performance not on profits but on earnings per share, imagine a situation where you had that much profits, those many shares. In the new year, you buy more, more companies getting more profits, but then you also issue shares to buy the company. So would you agree the denominator, the thing underneath, the number of shares will double. So if your profit doubles and your number of shares doubles, would you agree the earnings per share will not change? Yes, and it's possible that it might go down. So what we're trying to say is earnings per share is a much tougher thing to satisfy, tougher thing to improve than just total profits. Okay, so little points like that. I learned that from the examiner listening to one of his talks and obviously answer guides and things like that. I know Steve very well, and he allows me to use little quotations from his answer guides in my class notes because he thinks that'll help people to pass. All right. And he's right. The, I want to go back, therefore, to page 268. 268 is the page I would like you to read yourself uh, why earnings per share is such an important thing. It can be made objective. So just uh, highlight that word, and I'm sure you can read that story yourself. All right. We're not going to get an essay on earnings per share. You're going to get numbers. So let me bypass that. You can read that at your leisure. Because ahead, ahead of me, I have five questions to do. And then make a start on normal interpretation. Is that right? So let's go for uh, snapshot of EPS. Uh, what I did basically, I looked at the IS, IS33, and then I took out my phone or a camera, and I st stood over the IS, and I took a picture of the F7 part of the syllabus, or part of the uh, IAS. So the IAS is huge, but only that bit comes into F7. So I took a picture of it, and that picture is what you see here. Okay, so I'm going to use that picture as a bit of a map, what we could describe as a sat-nav, yeah? Um, uh, to help me to move from left to right, because that is the syllabus for earnings per share for F7. So if I can use that as a checklist moving from left to right, that'd be great. Now what's this basic? Do you notice first of all there's basic and there's diluted? So what I'd like you to do as my first challenge to you is draw a line please somewhere about there. Okay, uh, so we've divided di basic and diluted. So the next question, of course, in terms of kinds of EPS, is what is this basic? Basic is um, based on actual issues of shares. Issue of shares. So if shares are actually issued, we will do the basic earnings per share. So you could have an actual issue of full price, bonus issue, rights issue, like that. If you step across the line to the other side, we have something called diluted. Okay, diluted, as I say there, is what's known as a, a hypothetical position. Suppose, okay? So what happens, quite, I'll explain properly, obviously, when we do our, 
uh, figures. What we're saying there is if you have things like convertible bonds, the other day we did financial instruments, so if the convertible bonds became ordinary shares, would you agree the earnings per share will fall? So at the moment they're convertible bonds on which you're paying interest and all that kind of thing, but in three years time the people who hold the bonds at the moment, the bondholders, can convert in three years time into shares. And what you're doing as a student, as a preparer of earnings per share, you're treating it as if, pretending as if, that future conversion has occurred today, at the start of the year. So would you agree that the most important thing is the earnings per share will fall? There's a very high chance the earnings per share will fall. Then you have the share options. What does that mean? Uh, basically, you give options, share options, to big directors and people like that, valued employees, to force them to stay with the company. So you give them a piece of paper, and you might say to them, well, the current share price is, say, $4, but um, you can have this piece of paper for free. But in three years' time, and that date is mentioned in the share option, in three years' time, if the director comes back to the company with the, with the share option and has attached to it $3, you'll give them a full share. Okay, so basically what you're saying is current share price $4 and you're saying to the directors, if you work for us for the next so many years, at that point when you come back with the share option and throw it into the company, provided you give $3, we'll give you a full share. You see, and what happens the next day, the company, the directors sell the shares and make a huge profit. Don't forget, if the current share price is $4, and if the directors work for you successfully for three more years, that $4 could become $6, yes? And then they get it for $3, and they make a huge profit. And that's very controversial. Some people think it's not a good idea, but I, I know in the UK there are these big directors with very successful backgrounds who go from one company to the other, just claiming these share options as part of the package. So it's, it's very high profile. That's probably why the examiner examines it regularly. Share options. So can I just write on this side, assuming the worst happens. Okay. So basic is based on actual issues of shares. Yes, you might issue a share to acquire a subsidiary, for example. That's okay, as long as, it's right, as long as it's a basic issue of shares, a real issue of shares. Whereas the diluted is more hypothetical. Yes, if in the future there are bonds and share options and all that kind of thing, what will happen if it's converted? Won't the earnings per share fall? That's why I call it diluted. Diluted means something lower. Okay, now, the, before we... Um, look at a uh, little question. One other thing I ought to say is full price, whenever you're doing full price calculations, you have to do weighted averaging. Okay, so you always have to do weighted averaging. When you're doing bonus issues or rights issues, they go to existing shareholders only. Okay, existing shareholders only. And the examiner's expression, I picked this up from one of his written answers a few sittings ago, he says that a rights issue is like a full price and bonus issue rolled into one. Okay, it's like a full price and a rights issue rolled into one. So I'm going to write here, FP, please write within that little uh, oval shape, full price and BI, bonus issue, all rolled into one. If that's the case, you have a rights issue. So you can see why the examiner likes to examine rights. In so doing, he's testing you on bonus and full price. So let's come round to this little uh, decision here. I would say rights issues, rights issues are examiner's favorite. Second favorite, convertible bonds. Third favorite, share options. But if it's in the exam, you can't say, well, it's only your third favorite, you shouldn't be examining it. It's there. So can I just say, learn those three particularly, though I have seen bonus issues and MCQs and so on these days. Full price, of course, is very easy. 
So these things come up regularly, but this is his favorite. This is by far, examiner loves this. When I start doing it, you can see why he likes it so much. Okay, now, people have been emailing me and all that sort of thing saying, oh, I'm a bit afraid of the MCQs, what do I do, Francis, and so on. So what I've been doing with these class notes, um, wherever I can, I've been slipping in some MCQs from recent exams. So every six months nowadays, I'll have to do it every three months. I have to change the class notes based on the latest questions that I'm allowed to see. Uh, so here we are. If ACCA publishes it, I can see it. And so I'm going to bring into play as a challenge to you right now. Can you read that small little MCQ? Sorry about the, the small print, but I wanted to squeeze it in without making my class notes too big. They're quite big already. So I'll keep quiet while you read the question called water. And I want you to select a, B, C, and D. Which one? Have a go. I'm going to ask you to do it right now. Have a little, and I'll look at the message board for the answers. Which one? A, B, C, or D? What's your feeling? Any answers? So let's read this together. Here's a test from a recent exam. Uh, on average, you're allowed 3.6 minutes for each question. Water has correctly calculated its basic earnings per share for the current year. So the basic has been done. You get that? Has basic has been done. Which of the following items need to be additionally considered when calculating water's diluted earnings per share? A one for five rights issue. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Which side of the line does rights fall into? And obviously it is under basic. So is that anything to do with diluted? The answer, nope. Don't be distracted by all the numbers the examiner gave you there. Utterly irrelevant. It's not diluted. The issue during the year for convertible, which side of the line does convertible fall into? The diluted half. So that one I like. So I'll give that one a tick. The granting of during the year of director's share options. Yep, 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 we like that. And then he says, equity shares issued during the year as the purchase consideration for the acquisition of a new subsidiary. And obviously that new subsidiary is just normal accounting. That's not diluted. Brilliant. I can see everyone answering C as the answer. Okay. And if you read the feedback, people struggled with this question. But 3.6 minutes is not enough. You know, you and I just now did it in less than one minute. Not wrong, not half right, but fully, yeah, absolutely no problem. And notice, I've only just started doing earnings per share. How good will you be after we've done all the numbers? Okay, so do be prepared for some little MCQs where you don't have to do numbers. Okay, something like that. But I'm more concerned about can you do the numbers? And so we're now moving into these various exercises. Okay, so I've got five and here's the first one. Calculate earnings per share. Thank you for attempting that, by the way. It's very kind. Very good. Uh, the calculate for earnings per share for these separate, underlined separate, the year ends are December, and the, they're $1 shares. Full price issue. There's basic earnings per share. See? And uh, within that, you have a weighted average scenario there. So here we are. Balance at the start of the year is 2,000 shares. The own shares acquired is 300. Now, if I put that in a bracket, it'll add up nicely to the right. See? 
And the word outstanding, of course, means issued, doesn't it? The word outstanding means issued. And if I put the 250 in brackets and the 550 in brackets, it now adds up quite nicely left to right. Those are, those are some typical facts where the examiner wants you to do not so much, base, not so much earnings per share, but what's the, cal the, the figure for the weighted average number of shares. Can you do the calculation? See? Now, thinking about the own shares acquired, you may not know this, but um, the law allows you to buy back your own shares. There's nothing illegal about it. So I'll give you an example. A few years ago in the UK, we had a huge big food group, household names, brands, fantastic brand company, huge well-established brands. Okay. And an Australian food group were trying to take them over. You see? And so the, what happened was just before the Australian company got interested in them, the share price of the UK company had been falling. For the sake of argument, let's say the share price is 500 cents, and it's been falling, 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 and it reached something like 350. For whatever reason, they had a bad time, director problems, whatever. So from 500, they've fallen, fallen, fallen to 350. This Australian food group is looking at this UK group, thinking it'd be a lo lovely opportunity to get a presence in the UK market. Yes. So they come towards the UK group, make an offer. And so what the directors of the UK group did was they ran to the stock market in the UK, let's say London Stock Exchange, and used the company's spare cash to buy back the company's own shares. And because of supply and demand, the share price went back up. See, it went up back nearly up to 500. And the Australian group is thinking, at 350, I could afford it at nearly 500 can't afford it. And so they go off, you know, I've lost the battle because they've, they wanted to take over the company, but because the uh, uh, company has bought back its own shares, it is like a bid defense, okay, perfectly legal. And that sort of stuff comes up more at the higher levels of ACCA. For us, that's all you need to know. All right, what else can I say? Let's knock up some numbers as we play around with these um, calculations. As I say, their earnings per share is quite specialist knowledge, but easy if you know how to do these things. Okay, uh, that's what I will keep on saying. It looks scary because it's quite specialist, but a well-prepared student who comes, to comes on a course like this or does some home study or whatever should feel pretty relaxed about it. That much I'll say. So example one, page whatever that is, 269, and we've got here the basic EPS. Okay, how to do basic EPS, especially if you have a full price issue. So we have here a full price issue. This is to members of the public, not to existing shareholders only, to anyone who wants to buy shares. Okay, so how to do this? Uh, this is the calculation of the weighted average number of shares, ordinary shares. Earnings per share, by the way, is only based on ordinary shares, equity shares. Now, Steve, the examiner, does it in two ways. He'll either do it like this, or I'll show you the other way he does it. Okay. So what he does sometimes is he'll take 1,700 from the question, and then he'll multiply by, let me take the question, put the question on the screen again, the um, how many months have passed between the 1st of January and the 31st of May? And the answer is, of course, five months. How many months have passed from the 31st of, of May to the 1st of December? I suppose that will be, what, six of that? Six months. And from 1st of December to the end of December, obviously, one month. So what we're saying is the number of shares, 1,700, from the 1st of January to the 31st of May remains unaltered, remains the same. 
So if you're doing weighted averaging, the natural thing to do is to multiply that by 5 twelfths. See that? So I'll multiply by 5 twelfths. And so the answer here is 708, just rounding it off. And then the 5 twelfths, 1700, having been done, we now turn to the next lot. Apparently there's 2,500 shares now because 800 new shares were issued. And you multiply this thing by 6 twelfths, you see. And so this is obviously 1250. And this one is naturally 2250 because you've paid off some shares or you've um, uh, bought back some shares. And so you multiply by 1 twelfth. And so this thing feels like about 188. And so if you grab hold of these three things together, I believe that is 2146 using a calculator. And that becomes your answer. Very, very, it's like school stuff. Yes, a little kid can do that. So can you. <coughs> now, Steve does it in another way as well sometimes. What he'll do sometimes is he'll bring in 1,700 and he'll multiply by 12 twelfths for the whole year. You see? And obviously, if you come down here, that is naturally 1,700. What he'll then do is he'll bring in the 800 new shares and he'll count from that day till the end of the year. So that issue was made on the 31st of May. If you count June, July, August, September, October, November, December, seven months. And multiplying that out, you have 467. But for the last bit, you can't say plus, you have to say less. And 250 were bought back, so you need to multiply that thing by 1 twelfth. And of course, this is less 21, say. And so if you were to grab hold of all of these together, naturally the answer becomes 2146. So one or the other, whichever style you like. Because he's done both, I've shown you both. In the exam, just choose one. Okay, nice and easy start. We're now slowly getting into the cleverer bits of earnings per share. Lots and lots of these to do, so I've got to be a little bit careful with my time, or more importantly, your time. So, I'll just take you back there. If I can go back with your permission, we've survived the MCQ. We've also looked at the full price. May I, with your permission, give it a bit of a tick? Okay. And the next thing we're going to do is this bonus issue. So let's go to the bonus issue. The bonus issue actually is incredibly easy. It's almost too easy. People can't believe it's so easy. So I need to explain why we do it the way we do it. Okay. So let's have a quick read of this past exam question. Profit after tax is obviously earnings, and the examiner has given you two years next to each other. So wherever you can, always do the two years because you get more marks. And as you know, with the comparatives, a typical P&L will have this year and last year next to each other. And so we're doing the earnings per share at the bottom of the P&L. That also will have this year, last year next to each other. So student uh, users can uh, measure change. All right. And then the ordinary shares are outstanding. Outstanding, of course, means issued. Lovely. Until that date is 600,000. Now, when you're doing bonus issues, as you might have seen earlier, you treat them as if it was done at the start of the year. Because this is not a full price issue. It's a bonus issue to existing shareholders only. And so if the bonus shares are said to be, see, two for each, and there already are 600, I'm thinking on the lines of saying 1,200 new bonus shares. So I would say the total number of shares is now looking a bit like 1,800. 
Okay, and so how do you do your earnings per share? One thing I must ask you to put on to your question paper over here, the gap between this one and this one, last year the earnings were 180, this year the earnings are 225, so do you agree the earnings have gone up by, shall we say, 45? And because the base figure is last year at 180, if I divide by 180 like that, the percentage that has gone up by is what? What's that? About 25? Is it 25%? Feels like 25%. So it's up by 25%. And because it's the same shareholders involved, what you've got to make sure is when you do your earnings per share, that also has gone up by 25%. Okay. So this is the kind of thing we, we are trying to do right now. Okay, so where am I? Let's begin a new page. Always do a new page for a new question. So, example 2, page 270. This is your bonus issue. All right. Now, to just to help you to remember all these things, what I'm going to do in brackets it just gives you the idea behind these things. And even though in the exam it's quite rare these days with the new style of exam that you'll be asked to write too much about these earnings per share things, by me writing it on the screen with you, it sort of registers in your mind a little bit better. It's almost like the reason why we do it the way we do it. Okay, so, and most of these things are taken from the actual IAS 33. So let's write here, bonus shares are issued without new funds entering the company. Okay, because a long time ago, you, the company issued some shares, we paid a little bit extra, share premium, and today you're saying thank you for your loyalty, the share premium is becoming real shares. Okay, so without new funds entering the company, you see, therefore, the earnings per share will fall compared to a full price issue. Full price issue means new funds enter the company. Okay, so obviously the new funds available to the company to invest on which they'll make more earnings or profit. So it's very different to a full price. So the way the IS expects us to cope with it or suggests we cope with it is um, treat as if, please underline, the BI bonus issue had occurred at the start of the current year. Indeed, if you're doing last year, at the start of last year as well. Okay, so that's a very unusual calculation. Put that aside, let me show you how it's done and then I'll justify the reason, you know, why we did it like that, etc. So let's start with, now comes the actual solution, 2014 millions. Let's write that down. Now one of the tricks with this earnings per share regular exam question, or two, many questions, come up in the same sitting sometimes, um, one of the tricks is to lay it out as if you've done the questions like this before. It's not the first time. So my suggestion is use the entire width of your page. My friends who are markers tell me that um, earnings per share is one of the worst things to mark because number one is done really badly and the other reason is the layout is terrible. Yes, And so people who attempt it, uh, most of them fail on the question and half the people don't even attempt it. So I'd like you to lay it out nicely, get your maximum 
value in terms of marks. So let's start with earnings. And the question says the earnings is 225. Notice how carefully I've pushed it a little bit to the left. Okay. And then we'll divide by the number of shares. And this is where I have to be a little bit careful. The, there are 600 original plus the special 1,200 new bonus shares, bonus issue shares. Is that because the bonus issue is two for one? Okay. And so if you were to add those together, it looks like the figure here is something like 1,800. So if you divide, if you divide 225 by 1,800, not forgetting, of course, to multiply by 100 to give cents, the answer on the right appears to be 12.5. Okay, we've just done a past exam question in the last five minutes. Really easy stuff. But a little bit strange, isn't it? Because what will happen in the exam, my marker friends tell me, that when students do this, they take the 1,200 and they multiply by 3 twelfths and all that kind of stuff because of the number of months, you see? But you must never do weighted averaging when you're doing bonus issues. In fact, when you do last year's, if I can move on to that, so let's say adjusted 2013 EPS to be shown as a comparative in 2014's accounts, financial statements. So notice I'm not redoing. I can't, you see, once last year's published accounts has been published, you can't get it back. It's out there in the public domain, you see. All you can do is when you're doing this year's, the column for last year, the comparative can be changed, so people can compare to last year. Okay, but last year's accounts have gone. You can't, they've been published. But it's only the comparative we're talking about. And so how to do the comparative? You start with the earnings, of course. Okay, so we're going to start with earnings, and that is 180. Look at the question. And we're going to divide by the shares... And the shares, remarkably, remarkably, the shares are 1,800. Okay, so I'm going to bring in 1,800. So the, the concept is the bonus issue is backdated. So if you multiply by 100, the answer here is 10 cents. And so because it's the same shareholders involved, you divide all previous years by 1,800. So in the exam, you can imagine people getting that wrong. But it's so simple, you see. You pick up your 225, divide by 1,800 based on the new number of shares. Get an answer. Go to last year, pick up the earnings, divide by the same 1,800, job done. You see? So easy. Almost too easy. <laughs> That's why people get it wrong. They say, oh, it can't be so easy must be some problem here. So can I just ask you please to draw a line kindly between those two figures, the um, so if you look at the 2000, the 10 and the 12.5, 10 has become 12.5. Is that up by about 2.5, is it? So that's um, it's gone up by 2.5 cents. And if you divide it by 10 cents, the answer, of course, is that it's up by 25%. And if you look at the earnings, if I look at the earnings with you, the earnings is up by 25%. What's the earnings per share up by? 25%. So you see it exactly reflects the earnings. Okay, so I'll just write here, reflects 
earnings. And so downstairs, downstairs, I'd like to give you some crucial information. So you can just say, so how to remember for the exam. Crucial for exam. How to remember. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of points. Um, one obvious point is don't do weighted averaging. Don't do weighted averaging. And the reason is it's not a full price issue. If it's full price, you do weighted averaging. The bonus issue, you don't do. Don't do weighted averaging. I better just say for bonus issue. Okay, for bonus issue, you mustn't do it. And the other one to remember is uh, divide both years. Please write, divide both years by the full 1800 to preserve comparability with the past. And the reason, of course, is the same shareholders involved. I'm going to say in brackets, same shareholders involved, before and after the bonus issue. Okay, so that's a little expression that our examiner uses. Just in case you ask to ever explain when you're doing ratio analysis, you know, why do you do the earnings per share the way we do, the bonus issue, you have a few words there to go by. Okay, so do you notice there that the bonus issue and the full price issue are done very differently? If I can just boil it down to the essentials to take into the exam, when you're doing weighted average, sorry, when you're doing full price issue, you must do weighted average. Five months, seven months, all that stuff. When you're doing bonus issue, don't do weighted average. Make it look as if the bonus issue occurred on the first day of this year, and if you have to do last year, first day of last year as well. Amazing. And the reason is you're preserving comparability of the past on the grounds that last year, this year, same shareholders involved, because bonus issues only go to existing shareholders. Okay, so it's one of those little steps you've got to take to think about, and once you get it, it's very easy. All right, now, bonus is nice, but the one that I need to be spending my time on, your precious time, is this other one called rights. The one that causes all these problems for students. So, let's go to our little map. We've done our full price, we've done our bonus, we're just about to do this one called rights issues. Okay. And the reason why the examiner likes it, apart from the fact that students don't like it, is that it's quite a big calculation, you know, page and a half, or that kind of thing. So I'm going to do a nice big question. So if you can do this, you can do anything. So give that a quick read, please. Example three. Basic EPS. Basic doesn't mean easy, by the way, as I said before. Outstanding means issued. Lovely. So profit after tax, that means earnings. Three years. Oh no. Three years. So I've chosen one of the most comprehensive questions our examiners ever set. Might even be the most. So I'm thinking, why not do three years with you? And if the examiner asks you for one year, you can do it. No problem. Okay, it's just to develop your strength. The number of shares issued is 500,000, and the rights issue is one new share for every five outstanding. Listen to this, one new share for every five. And so I've done the sums for you. I've gone for 100,000 new shares. So can I say, therefore, 600 now issued. Okay, now in issue after rights. After the rights issue, there's now 600,000 shares in issue. 
Now, here come one or two interesting points. The exercise price is said to be $5. Now, what I mean by that is something like this. When the uh, directors decided that on the 1st of March, on the 1st of March, they would make a rights issue. Uh, by the way, the 1st of March, if this is a December year end, two months after, two months after, the start of the year. Two months after the start of the year is when the rights issue is made. So January and February have gone and then they make the, the first of March. Now if I just say to you how this thing works, you can just read the rest of the question please. And I'll just uh, show you how this thing works. Something like this is what I have in mind. Okay, The year that we're dealing with is let's say it starts here and it ends there. That's the 12 months. Okay. Now, basically the directors are saying to their shareholders or anyone who wants to listen, if your name is on the share register on the 1st of March, two months from now. So let's say it's the start of the year. They make this public announcement through all the right channels, etc. Newspaper, adverts, whatever it might be. So you've got, uh, you've got the start of the year. At the start of the year, the share price is approximately 10 cents uh, or 10 pounds, uh, 10 dollars, I beg your pardon, 10 dollars. Okay, so not cents, but dollars, 10 dollars. And then they're saying to the shareholders, they're making this announcement notice on the 1st of uh, the day of first day of the year, 1st of January 2014, and they're saying that if your name is on the share register in two months' time, currently the share price is $10, but you can, you can pick up some shares at half price. If you have five shares, we'll give you one share at half price. Now, would you agree most shareholders would say, yep, I'm ready, I'm going to take it, provided I've got enough cash, of course. So you're the company, I'm the shareholder. So if I'm a small shareholder with literally five shares and the shares are worth at the start of the year approximately $10, if I have five shares on the 1st of March, the company will allow me to subscribe, pay for one more share. Would you agree? Suddenly I've got six shares. Okay. Now, to get my additional one share, I have to pay just $5. So do you agree it's about half price? Okay, so the idea behind it is the moment the company makes this announcement that if people are shareholders they'll get half price shares, loads of people who haven't barely heard of the company suddenly get very interested in the company and they want to pile in and become shareholders. It's almost like, you see, a parallel example might be where the directors announce that on the 1st of March we're going to pay a dividend. doesn't matter if you haven't been a shareholder for the whole year, but if your name is on the register on the 1st of March, even if you became a shareholder the previous day, doesn't matter. If your name is on the, first of, is on the register, share register on the 1st of March, you'll get a dividend, whatever dividend figure might, it might be. Maybe it's a big dividend. And so do you agree, people who, are, who haven't even heard of the company suddenly get attracted by the dividend and they jump in and because of supply and demand the share price spikes up. Okay. In fact in our example the share price from the start of the year which was about $10 has spiked up to about $11. Okay. So this is the idea behind it. The fact that the good news of an impending half price share or an impending dividend makes the share price go up because people are trying to become shareholders. Okay, so just supply and demand, basic economics. Right, let's get back to the question. The fair value of one ordinary share immediately before exercise on that date is $11. Now, this is what they call the cum rights price. Okay, cum. Cum means including. Cum means, in RTS means rights. Cum means including. A Latin word, cum. There's another word called X. X is without. Cum is including. 
Okay, you get shares, cum div, ex div, some of you may know that. All right, so those are the facts. Now comes the question. So if I just say for the last time, the share price at the start of the year was approximately $10, but because of this announcement, it shot up to $11. So what we've got to do is to take all that into account, following the method in the IAS, to solve this question. Okay, so allow me please to do this not like you do it in some other ACCA papers. I want to do it only based on the IAS. Okay, obviously in my paper I have to follow the IAS. So if you learnt it in different methods, please give me a chance to show you how to do it with this particular IAS, because our paper is IAS's in the main. Right, let's open up a brand new page. I'm going to need a couple of pages to do this. This is the famous example 3, page 271. This is the rights issue. All right, rights issue. Uh, please, this is still basic. As I say, it's not easy. It's actual. That's why they call it basic. For some reason, the examiner gets very upset in his feedback. He uses very strong language. He said, why do people call it diluted when they know it should be basic? And it's almost like I'm going to knock off half a mark or something. See, So it's quite an expensive mistake. So don't call it diluted, OK? Our examiner and his markers don't like the word diluted used out of place. Basic means real issues of shares. Right, now I need to give you a long story by way of idea. Just say, these go to existing shareholders only. Existing shareholders at less than full price. Less than full price, comma, but above bonus or free price. Okay, and one or two other things I must not forget to mention. Uh, one is the examiner says that in his eyes, a rights issue is said to be roughly equal to a full price and a bonus issue rolled into one. Okay, rolled into one. And so do remember that. So what we're saying is when you're doing a full price, you do weighted averaging. When you're doing a bonus, you do an increasing of number of shares. So all that is built into this amazing little calculation. And so we move on, four or five more lines, if you don't mind, to reflect the bonus element in the rights issue price, comma, we need to use a special factor or fraction. Okay, we need to use a special factor or fraction. And that fraction or factor is given in the IAS as cum over x. Cum means including, x is without. Now, the cum is always given in the question, and the x always to be calculated. Okay, so always to be calculated. And so how do we, why do we need this factor? Quite simply, this comes the, here comes the big point. The reason why we need that factor is to increase the number of shares. Okay, so quite a long story, but it comes up regularly. And if you remember this little story, or take it down, then no earnings per share 
rights can ever be to you. To increase the number of shares from the date of the rights issue, comma, working backwards in time, please underline backwards, backwards in time for all earlier part years or full years. So to write it down like that, it'll just be easier for you later. Part years or years. And the reason, the examiner says, to preserve comparability with the past. Because same shareholders are involved. Okay, it's a little bit like our old friend bonus issues. So there you are. That's the idea behind it. Uh, 10, 12 lines there just to help you to remember it. So underline words like past, underline words like increase, backwards, earlier. So it seems like when the issue of shares is made, you don't look forwards, you actually look backwards. Not forwards, but backwards. Really important. Okay. Now, how to do the stuff. Let me show you my method, and I hope you will be able to churn it out on the big day. So here's my method. How do we do these rights issues? I'm going to use a couple of pages. We've used almost half a page already. So let's continue with this. How many steps shall we take? You're right. Three. Okay. So when I can, like leasing and all these other things, I will go for these three steps. Step one, step two, step three. Most people can remember that. So, let's start step one. The first step is to calculate the X rights price. Calculate X. Uh, some people call it the theoretical X rights price. Some people call it T-E-R-P-S, TERPS. Any expression you like, X is the quickest. Now, imagine you're a big company and I'm a small shareholder with five shares, okay? My shares, just at the point of the rights issue arriving on the market, just before, on the morning of that day, my shares, according to the question, are worth $11. Okay, and that's the cum rights price. Check it out in the question, it's towards the end of the question. So if you multiply it out left to right, this figure here is $55. Okay, so there you are, $55. And then you have these rights shares, I'm going to say plus the rights issue, one for five, one for five, and that of course is one share. And that one share, you have to contribute $5. So this is the rights issue price. Okay, so if you multiply left to right, this looks like $5. And so what we're saying is if you add this up, we now have six shares. And this $5 here, if I just make it red, does that make it look a bit different? Those uh, five dollars means the portfolio of my shares is now worth, the collection of my shares is now worth sixty dollars. And if you divide one by the other, obviously the answer is ten dollars per share. You see? And that's ten dollars per share. And that's what we call the X rights price. Okay. This is known as the X rights price. In fact, I made up that figure as we started. At the start of the year, this company's shares were about $10 each. And then there was this offer for 
um, to the existing shareholders for you know of cheap shares of one for five and loads of people became shareholders so the share price the share price because of supply and demand went up from 10 to 11. So 11 is the cum rights price 10 is the x rights price okay so those two things you need to remember in fact as we've done that we might as well move to step two. Step two is about three lines long, so don't worry about it too much. Step two, I have to bring into play the computation of the bonus fraction. Okay, so I'll say computation of the bonus fraction. The computation of the bonus fraction. And that bonus fraction is given as cum over x. Cum, that's the bonus fraction. Okay, now notice it's top heavy, isn't it? It's top heavy. What I mean by that is the cum we worked out, actually it was given, 11 in dollars and the X we calculated just now as 10 see that 10 if you feel it's more user-friendly you could call it 1.1 that's also fine we could leave it like this whichever style you like okay now, that's your computation of the bonus fraction. Doesn't take long, does it? Pretty easy, that. So, notice what I've done. I've given you a long story about how to do it. Don't forget that. Do read that just before the exam as well. Then I've shown you how to do the x right. excuse me, how to w work out the x rights price. And then I'm showing you why we do the x rights price, because you have to use this little fraction. Now, lots of students get that upside down for some reason the examiner tells us. So can I just say one way of remembering it is how many letters has cum got? Answer, three. How many letters has x got? Answer, two. Is that top heavy? And don't forget, if you go back to our little story here, I was saying to you when it comes to the rights issue, you must try to increase you see that reason to increase the number of shares from the date of the rights issue working backwards in time etc and because you want to increase the number of shares you multiply by cum over x that's the idea okay so that's why those words even though they seem too many they do help students to remember how to do it given that this is done really badly and so we come to the last step step three as we get this thing to complete finish it off so where are we let me see if I can move on to another page say the second page of rights issues so let's say rights issues continued rights issues continued and this is your step three you see so easy have your steps and they, you cannot be defeated by it Step three, this is the big one. This is the computation of your earnings per share. My suggestion is leave a little bit of space on the right for your answer and then do all your workings on the left. So if I say 2015 about there, 2014 about there, 2013 about there. 14 is the difficult one or the one that will carry the most marks. So I would say about a third of your space should be kept aside and then you can say to the examiner, look examiner this is my answer. Okay, this is my answer. Whereas on the left these are my workings. So you do your workings and you bring out the answer to the right and the marker can mark it right or wrong, hopefully right. All right, so how do we do these workings? Let's start, because we've got to do three years. We've got to be a little bit quick with our time. EPS for 2013 
as originally reported. So earnings, have a look at the question. What's the earnings for last year? Is it 30? Go check. 30,000. And so we need to divide that thing by the shares. And the shares last year, before the rights issue, 500,000. And tapping that into a calculator, 6 cents. Now be careful, I've kept my 6 cents quite far away from the answer. Yes, because I haven't reflected what I ought to reflect yet. Now I'm going to do this bit. This is the clever stuff. Restating for 2014 accounts comparative figure regarding 2013. Regarding 2013, we have earnings of 30,000 divided by the shares, and the shares obviously 500,000. And that 500,000 shares, you need to multiply by the famous bonus fraction. Okay, so I'll multiply by 11 divided by 10. Yes? And so if you put that into calculator, that is 550,000. So if you divide 30 by 550, the answer, of course, is 5.5 cents. Don't forget, it's always multiply by 100 to give cents. So in the 2013 line, not forgetting that we always multiply by 100 to give cents, the answer appears to be 5.5. So somewhere around here I'm going to say 5.5 cents. All right, so that's the current year done, or shall we say last year done. Just one little problem I'm facing here. If you could just say in brackets, or... What if question does not give earnings but only earnings per share? Obviously, you can go back and work out the earnings, but if there's lots of activity during the year, you'll find that's very difficult to do if there are other issues of shares, etc. So if the examiner doesn't give you the um, actual earnings, but he gives you the earnings per share, you have to do it in a slightly different way. What you do is you pick up your six cents and you multiply not by 11 over 10, but by the opposite of that, upside down, 10 over 11. Okay, what's known as the reciprocal. or inverse. It's like school arithmetic because you're dealing with the answer the denominator has to be turned upside down to get the correct score and obviously that figure there is 5.5. Okay, so where the questions are very simple it's okay you can do it the long way but where they are longer bigger questions try to use this upside down of the factor trick. Okay, what else? Let's now come round to doing the current year and last year. And then we we'll move on to diluted and make a start on reading the examiner's article. This is my hope for today. 2014, the earnings is said to be, have a look at the question, 38,000. And so that 38,000, I need to divide by the number of shares. So I'll divide by the number of shares. And the shares, of course, I don't know what they are. So I'll do that through a working.
Okay. And then when you're doing when you're doing 2015 next year, the earnings of course is given as 45,000. And what we have to do is divide that thing by the shares. And obviously, if you have a rights issue, if you have a rights issue, the number of shares, if you remember, after the rights issue is 600,000. And so it is that thing that comes into play, you see. So we divide by 600,000. And if you multiply that out, the answer here, by the way, we don't know what the sense is. But here we do know that the answer is something like 7.5. Whereas earlier, we dealt with 2013 miles up there. 2015 is easy. 2014 is the one that will carry the most marks. It is to that last step we are now turning our attention. Now, about three or four years ago, I developed a method that I've begun to use in class, and I'm going to try it out on you, see whether you like it. Students are saying to me, this, is a, this seems to work in the exam. Okay, because this is an area, this is the point, uh, this is the area where students get it wrong at this point. Mustn't be you. So here's my workings for 2014, the problem year, the year when there's the rights issue. And just between you and me, I'm going to tell you there are five columns. Okay, and so let's do them in columns like we do our stuff like the um, leasing, for example. So we have the date, we have the actual number of shares, nearby you have the fraction of the year. Near that you could have your bonus fraction and then on the far right we have our total numbers of shares. Okay, you will notice that the word fraction has happened twice. Easy for you to remember. And so let's go down to this last little bit. The date is 1-1-2014. The actual number of shares, of course, is 500. The number of months before the rights issue is 2 twelfths. What are those months? Jan and Feb. January and February 2014. Go have a check of the question. Let me just turn that up on the screen. The, yes, two months before, or two months have passed since the start of the year before the rights issue arrived on the market. So those are the two months I'm talking about. So those are the pre-rights. It's almost like pre-acquisition. Pre-rights issue, like you're doing consolidations. Pre-acquisition, that's very important. Now the bonus fraction we decided was cum over x, 11 over 10. And then literally what you do, you multiply like this. And the answer that turns up there is 91, using a calculator, 667. And then 1-3-2014, after the rights issue. This is the rights issue date. What happens is you have an original number, 500, and then of course you have the rights issue, 1 for 5, which is another 100,000. So if you grab hold of them like that, this comes to 600,000. You see? And how many months do we need to bring into play to build it up to 12 months? Obviously 10. So if we get the pre-rights months right, this second half of it is second part of it is very, very easy. Now comes the killer point, if I can use that word, really nasty point, and that is this one goes straight through like that, and there's no bonus fraction. 
Remember I was saying to you, when you do your rights issue, it's from the date of the rights issue, not looking forwards in time. So from the date of the rights issue, so the start of the year is here, and two months later you had the rights issue date. You mustn't stand here and look forward. You actually have to look backwards. Not forward, but backward. Why is that? You want to preserve comparability with the past. Okay, and do you agree that 10 twelfths is actually looking forwards? So you don't do a bonus fraction for the forwards bit, you only do it for the backwards bit. Tricky business that. And so once you multiply that out, this figure appears to be 500,000. So if you add like this, this grand total is 591. 667. 591 and 667. And that thing needs to come into play here, see? 591 and 667. So if we divide out 38 by 591, the answer, I believe, is 6.4, and that indeed is the final answer. Okay, so all those little steps, the five columns, you must master them, because without that sort of technique, you'll find it very hard to do. Okay, so all I can say is do have a look. If you need to look at the recordings, the, um, those are available also to you, as you know, if you want a little bit more detail. Otherwise, I'm afraid we have to march on to capture even more territory, the stuff about the share options and diluted stuff. Okay, so let me go back to our little picture we've been looking at. If I can just flick back a couple of pages, this one. So we've just done rights issues. We're now crossing the line into the convertible areas. Okay. So these are rather special. So I need to, in, in due course, do this one and this one, and that's your earnings per share done. So don't forget, we've spent a long time introducing it. We did an MCQ, so we have some feel for this diluted stuff. My concern, though, is to get uh, a couple of questions done so you can feel relaxed about it. Here we are. So on page 271, you have there the convertible bonds. I'll keep quiet for a few seconds while you read the question, and then you and I will smash the question, no problem. Past exam question. Profit after tax, right, let's go. Profit after tax, that's earnings. The outstanding means issued, as always. If you divide like this, answer, no problem. That's the basic. Okay, I'm not worried about the basic. So let's say in the exam, if that whole thing is four marks, the bit that I've just done with you will be one out of one. So I've got one out of one, not a bad average. Now comes the next one, which is the other three marks. Apparently there are convertible bonds, 1,000 bonds, and each block of 10 bonds is convertible into 15 shares. So would you agree once the conversion happens, you're going to have 1,500 shares, ordinary shares. You used to have 10,000 shares. Now you have 1,500 more shares. Or I suppose altogether you have 11,500 shares. Okay. And that's what you need to divide the shares over. Now the only trouble is or you need to divide the earnings over. The only trouble is the earnings has got to be adjusted for the bond interest. So what we're saying is this theoretical conversion in the, in the future is being you know, done now. So let's see if I can hold your attention. You do the basic earnings per share and you get a mark something. Now I'm trying to do the convertible shares. Basically, it's, it works something like this. At the start of the year, 
you have an issue, you're the company, you have an issue, some convertible bonds. At some future date in three years' time, I'll come forward to you and say, can, you, can I give you those bonds back? Can you, can you give me real shares? Because it says I can do that. So, last night, when I was preparing for this lecture, I did this on my computer just to hold your attention. Can you see the word convertibles there? Okay. Now, what we're saying is something, is something like this. The um, convertibles at some future date is going to be converted into ordinary shares. You see, I know it's at some future date, but we're treating it as if that conversion happened today when you first issued the shares. So even though it's going to happen in the future, what we're doing is at the moment, the moment on the first day of the year, the company issues the convertibles, we are assuming that the conversion has happened. So would you agree there'll be more shares? And obviously there won't be any interest. That is the idea behind it. Okay, now let me offer you the calculations of that to put that little yellow sheet and all that into practice. Okay, I'm assuming that the yellow sheet is the ordinary shares. Okay, let's see if I can write something down. Let's start another page perhaps. Quite a long topic, isn't it? So many specialist things. And, um, but the next topic which comes up regularly, interpretation, this is part of interpretation anyway, uh, that tends to be done, you know, quite, you can easily pick up the story. So I'm going to do this because it's specialized. This is meant to be for homework, but I'm going to do it in class because the exam is now quite close by. And I'm sure many of you are worried about all kinds of things, other subjects, etc. Let's just do it. Let's just do it diluted earnings per share. Beautiful. Now, what I'm going to say in brackets, idea, as if, underline, future conversion occurs N-O-W. Now, it's as if the future conversion occurs now, comma, at date of issue of the convertible bonds. Any convertibles, okay? The big word is not the bonds, because you have convertible preference shares, you could have convertible loan notes, all kinds of stuff, but the word convertible is the main word. Okay, let's get busy with this. Let's sort out the basic. The basic EPS earnings is 1,000. The number of shares, the number of shares is 10,000. You see? And so the earnings per share, multiplying by 100, of course, is, is so I'll just multiply this by 100. And so the answer over here becomes 10 cents. Not 100, 10 cents. So that's your basic. If that's one mark, grab it. Unfortunately, many students can't do anything more than that. That's all they can manage. But still, it's one mark, isn't it? It's not zero. So what I want to do is to move you beyond that into the diluted. So I'll just switch the colors around to make you look at this diluted as if it's really important, which indeed it is. Diluted EPS, so how to do it. What I'm going to do is to give you the principle and then I'm going to put the principle into practice. So the exam, even though you don't have to write out the principle, it will help you remember it from today onwards. Okay, so the earnings, I'm going to add to this the interest saved on, next line, bonds upon conversion. Conversion I'm going to put into inverted commas. Pretend conversion. 
comma, net of tax. As you know, interest is an allowable deduction in arriving at the taxable profit. So if you lose interest, because there's no bonds, you lose tax relief on it. That's the concept of it. Okay, we divide the earnings by the number of shares, and the shares have to go up by the extra so-called converted shares. Okay, so let's now go off and do our stuff. Therefore, the earnings as for basic in dollars. Notice, keep some space on the far right. So if I move a couple of inches to the left, it'll look a bit better, the layout. So we'll take the 1,000, and then basically we're going to add to it interest added back on so-called conversion net of tax. So it'll always give you the little tax figure. So don't do it gross, do it net. The gross to start with is 100. If you take away the tax given in the question is 40, after tax obviously the adjustment is 60. Okay, so the reason why, you see, the reason why you do it like that is the earnings is after tax, is it not? And if the earnings is after tax, let the adjustment be after tax as well. Otherwise, if you do the earnings after tax but the adjustment gross, that'll be marked wrong. Okay, if a, if a machine is marking that, and you get it wrong, you get zero out of two, if that's two marks, MCQ. If a human being was marking it, obviously they'd say, well, it's only a small adjustment, never mind, knock off half a mark, give them one and a half out of two, because it's only a small mistake. So that's the problem with MCQs, right or wrong, no marks for workings, even though you have to do workings to convince yourself that you're on the right path. All right, so all those things I'll mention on revision in a, in a few days' time. So let's write here, adjusted earnings is going to be 1,060. And so I want to divide that by the number of shares. So I'll divide by the shares. And so if I can start up by saying as for basic, as for basic, a little bit to the left, 10,000. And so we'll bring into play the adjustment converted inverted commas, at the maximum. Okay, so if there are any alternatives, always go for the maximum. And so if you bring in a thousand and divide by ten bonds, we multiply this thing by fifteen shares. You see? So if you add that in, that feels like 1,500, like we had on our question paper, we work that out. And so if you grab hold of all of this, I suppose the figure that turns up here is actually 11,500. And if you divide it out like that, the answer, of course, is 9.2 cents. 9.2 cents. Okay, so very, very straightforward indeed. I just be a little bit careful. If your diluted works out to more than your basic, because you're adding back huge amounts of interest, 
That's called anti-dilutive, and you don't disclose it. Okay, so just be careful. Uh, what I'm saying is if the interest figure is really large, the 1060 could be 1,200. And then when you divide by the number of shares, including the converted, that 9.2 might become 12, let's say. And once it becomes 12, clearly it's more than the basic. And that's when we call it anti-dilutive. Okay. And in those cases, you don't disclose. Just little tricks like that for you to remember. Uh, it might come up, who knows. But that's the basic model that you must know. And so we come to the last little step, which is in our class notes. This is the share options. So can you give that a quick read, please? Share options. Notice it's diluted. The profit after tax, which is another word for earnings, 1.2 million, see? And of course, the number of shares all done for you. And so if you divide that out like that, I believe the answer is 24 cents. Okay. Lovely. That's the basic. Now comes the interesting bit. The average fair value of one share throughout the year is $4. And the average, the weighted average number of shares under option with the directors is 1 million. So you've given the directors some pieces of paper called options. At some future date, if they come forward with those million options, or as many as they like, it costs them nothing to get the options. But if they want to convert the options in three years' time into real shares, they've got to come in with $3 per share attached to each option. And the company will take the option from them including the $3, and give them full price shares. If the share price currently is $4, who knows in three years' time that $4 might be much bigger. Yes? Six, seven dollars, who knows? And because they're only paying $3 for it, and they're getting a share worth $7, they've made a pretty good profit there. And so what many directors are doing, they're selling it and going off to another company because they're only tied in, in so far as the options are around. Okay, so this is the big news. Uh, lots of people are talking about these options. So, one thing I must say to you is, if the full price is $4, and the option exercise price is $3, is there a discount of about $1? Okay, the discount. So you're giving it, it's almost like a bonus. And we divide that by the full price, which is $4. The discount percentage, yes, the um, amount to which it's been diluted, is something like 25%. Okay, so this is one of the most important calculations that we've got to do. So let's go off and do our usual brand new page. Always start a new question on a new page. Here we have it. The example 5 diluted EPS, diluted earnings per share. EPS. So, as always, we'll put in brackets the idea. It's as if the options are converted now. And options are given to existing, or, or not so much existing shareholders, uh, ex uh, to directors and valuable employees are converted now. Okay, and the idea is the options are given to directors and important people like that, powerful people, 
are given to directors, etc., senior employees, at a concessionary price, cheaper price. It's almost like you're giving them a discount. like a bonus element. This is the idea behind it. So we're talking about share options. Very popular with the examiner. So let's get a couple of ideas in place. The basic EPS. Basic EPS. You bring in your earnings. 1.2 million. See, lovely. Divided by the shares, which is 5. Tap, tap into our calculator. Answer 24 cents. Always show earnings per share in cents, not in dollars. And so as I move along to the next bit, the diluted, again, I'll just switch colors to make it look a bit different diluted EPS. What we're going to do is to pick up the earnings and there's no change. 1.2 million. So the earnings never changes. The only time earnings changes when you have that interest added back when you have a convertible. Do remember that. And then what we're going to do is to divide that by the number of shares, ordinary shares. Now that will change, obviously. So I'll put that in into a little box. This is a working, of course. And so the answer in due course will have to be less than 24. Because obviously, if the upstairs remains the same, the numerator 1,200,000, and the number of shares goes up, inevitably the 24 cents will fall. Okay, so that's it. Now, how can I explain this? These are the famous options. So let me try this little trick. The, let's say, for example, the company had an issue uh, many years ago, uh, let's say for some time at the start of the year, They've got an issue, this thing called options, share options, okay? They've issued them to directors and important people. Uh, imagine that's me. Use a lot of imagination, okay? Let's say I'm not just an a lecturer. I'm some big director type, okay? And you want me to work for your company for three more years. So what you do is you give me, make some agreement with me, and you give me these legal pieces of paper called share options. And at some future date, in three years' time, I can convert it into ordinary shares. But when I convert it, I must add $3 to it. Okay, so if I bring back the option to you with $3 attached, you'll take it from me and give me a full price share. Now I realize that's going to happen in the future, but let's remove the time difference. Imagine that happens today. So would you get the feeling that if that were to happen, the number of shares will go up? Okay, so this is representing the shares. This is representing, obviously, the options. So that's the idea behind it. Very, very easy. MCQs, this has come up as in recent, recent sittings. So how many steps shall we take? You're right. The usual three. Step one. Calculation. of the percentage dilution of option price compared to full price. Option exercise price compared to full price. Now be careful of this. The option price is said to be $4.00. I'm sorry, the full price is $4, but the option exercise price is said to be $3. 
And so if you compare one to the other, this is one dollar divided by four times a hundred, and that's 25% dilution. Okay, so in the exam, if you get some horrible number, you've probably got it wrong, because our examiner always makes it some nice round number. The only time I've seen it else, you know, other than 25 and 50 and 40, is where it's 33.33. That's fine, one third. But if you get 15.67, you know you've got it wrong. So please check. Step two, really easy step. What you do, quite simply, is multiply You multiply, I apologize, can we see the screen? My fault, I'm sorry, got a bit carried away there. So can I give you a chance to just write that down? Entirely my fault, nothing to do with you, you were perfect. Just me not concentrating, my apologies. Diluted earnings per share, earnings no change, 1.2 million, the number of shares obviously we need to work out. Write that down, please. And so we go to the workings downstairs when you're ready. Step one, step two, step three. So step one, calculation of the percentage dilution of the option price compared to the full price. Okay, so basically what's happening in terms of how does it work I was showing you just now, the piece of paper that's called an option, the option holder brings it back to the company, adds $3 to it, and the company gives a real share. That's how it works. Really easy. Nothing more to learn. Okay, so the full price is $4. The option exercise price is, say, $3. And so the dilution, the concession you're giving to your existing or the directors, is something like 25%. And then what you do is you multiply the percentage by the number of options. So you pick up your 25% and you multiply by the number of options. The number of options, of course, is 1 million. Don't multiply by the number of shares multiply by the number of options. And so that figure there is 250. It's a little bit of a, like an adjustment factor. Or to put another way, this is the bonus element contained. So let's say this is the bonus element within, contained within, the option exercise price. Bonus element contained within the option exercise price. That's what this 250 is, some kind of a, a bit like a rights issue, I suppose, the bonus element. All right, so step two. So did you get a chance to write that down? So sorry, not to put it on the screen. Uh, step one, calculation of the percentage dilution of the option price compared to the full price. Answer, 25%. Step two, take the 25% and multiply by 1 million. You see? And that's 250. And so we go for step three as we complete. Tiny steps, actually, these are, compared to, say, rights issues, which are a bit more serious. So step three, what happens is you simply add the bonus element to the number of shares used for basic. Okay. And so the way we do it is we pick up our 5 million, which is the original, and then we'll add to that 250,000, which is the adjustment. And so what we're saying is the figure over here, the figure over here is 5,000, 5 million, 
250,000. So that's your adjusted. number of shares. The adjusted number of shares. Okay, so now let's pick that up and run with it. Let's bring it back. So I'll go back, back, back here. And remember we had, a, we had an empty box. Excuse me, I'm going to write into that box 5250. And so the answer becomes 22.9, one decimal place usually. Okay, so that's all your, your little <coughs> earnings per share calculations. Just for a few minutes, I want to show you the next topic. Make a start on the last topic. Uh, because of that little problem there, we need to just, I'll keep you back for a few more minutes to get you started on the next topic. Okay, so... Let's go back to our class notes, which is here somewhere. Uh, beyond that, of course, quite a few practice optional questions. You don't have to do them, all optional. If you're just doing one subject, obviously, then have a look. Otherwise, quite a few comments there for you to read, and if you have time, do have a look. I don't want to spend any more time on that. You can read that at your leisure. I just want to make a bit of a start on analysis and interpretation, which I'm going to spend most of next time on. Those are small bits of cash flow as well. So let's say analysis and interpretation. Um, may I say it's a common sense topic, but very popular with examiner. Okay, I would say even more popular than earnings per share. But earnings per share is part of this. And so what I'm going to do is to show you how all this works. Exam relevance, the idea, the balance sheet, the word reserves. Interpretation is more important than ratios. Number crunching is not enough. Can you just highlight that? The examiner always says that to us at these meetings I attend. Examiner's meetings. So don't just, basically what's happening in the exam these days, we're getting 15 mark questions on interpretation, including ratios. So what you need to do is to say to yourself, okay, 15 marks, because many more marks are given for the interpretation, the writing about it. If I'm doing my ratios, I'll spend, say, five marks worth of time, and I'll double that to 10 marks worth of time when I'm doing my interpretation. So the, 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 the sort of message from the examiner is something like one mark to two marks, like that. Okay, one mark ratios two marks interpretation. You cannot fail a ratios question because you do a few calculations, make a few comments, and that's it. Okay, as I'll show you when I see you next time. Okay, lots and lots of stuff there, examiner's article, etc. Now, we're moving into the exam relevance. It's been coming up regularly. The uh, specimen exam, the actual exam, and then if I just ask you to add to this also it came up in June 2015 and in September 2000. He's gone mad for this recently. So I'm wondering whether four times without a break, this December will be the fifth time. It's very prominent in the syllabus. The only competitor to that is if the examiner says do some um, cash flows. Again, interpret that as well. Okay, but for the moment, I want to concentrate just on the interpretation side. Okay. Um, 30 marks, very unlikely. MCQs, I'm going to say. Okay. Don't forget these areas are very, very important indeed. Moving on. Most users of accounts are non-specialists. It's true, isn't it? Not experts in accounting matters, and much of the terminology, practices, and so on are a mystery. So what we're trying to do is to demystify, take away the mystery. And the best article is written by the examiner. So for homework, you must read that article. But let me just take you into a few bits of the article before we finish. Sorry to overrun slightly. Okay, there's a little cartoon there which says, if you're, uh, if you're doing interpretation, what you're doing is checking the health with the stethoscope. 
So I come to you, let's say, as the patient or person you're checking, and you look at my heartbeat, and you compare it to last year's heartbeat or whatever when you last checked me. And last year I looked much fitter than I am today, judging from the heartbeat. And so what you say to me is go off and have, have a long walk somewhere or walk regularly or do some gym work or get fit. You look so unfit, you see. So you're like a doctor in the exam, a physiotherapist, nurse, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's the role you're performing. Very easy stuff. Now, there are lots of little mysteries that the shareholder is confused by. One is the word reserves. Okay, reserves are obviously profit. But one of the mysteries is the paradox, one of the odd things, is retained profits could be plenty, and yet cash could be negative. How come? The answer is quite simple. It's possible that the company might have sold goods, but never collected it. You see? And for things like that, you have to explain how it all works. And so as we go along, I want to set you up to do some homework reading. As I say there, interpretation is more important than ratios. The ratios will be up to five marks. And the interpretation, the words, will be ten marks. And as you can see there, the person on the, on the right is like your typical student who says, ah, here's my wonderful opportunity. I'm going to do 25 ratios or 15 ratios. But the examiner says after a while, enough! I don't want to hear any more ratios. Can you do me some interpretation? So I would say the maximum you should do is five ratios. Okay. And then the rest of the time you must do your uh, interpretation. So this is an absolute and utter must read, okay? This is a must read article written by none other than our examiner. But me, Francis, I have highlighted the formulae and all that, okay? So the examiner is basically saying it will come up as often as he can manage it. And so what you need to do is to read through that. He talks about trend analysis. He talks about horizontal analysis, industry average in com comparison, all that kind of thing. So he can give you any kind of examination question. So I want you to read those, that quite long article, including the past exam question contained therein. But there's one paragraph out of the whole article I want to pick out as we conclude today. So we move on a couple of pages. This one, this one, this one. This is important. So round about page 281, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this and then we've finished. What other modules of ACCA do you teach? Yinka, my friend, I'm sorry, I used to do some P2s, but nowadays I'm, I do some SEMA, and, and for ACCA I only do this. I wish I could do more, but there are cleverer people than me who do all the uh, stuff like, you know, uh, management and stuff like that. I'm, this is my specialist subject, but thank you for asking. We have a fellow called Martin Jones who does the P2. You'd love him. Same methods as me. Fantastic techniques, okay? But he uses the same. That's the next level up. But he does the P2, not me. You'd love him, though. He's a really nice bloke. Very funny and everything. Okay, by far the most common complaint by markers is that candidates' comments explaining the movement of differences in reported ratios lack any depth of commercial understanding. You see? So you must show some commercial understanding. A typical comment may be that data collection has improved from 60 to 40 days. The examiner is saying, I won't give any marks for that, maybe half mark. You see? What is required from a good answer that's obviously very important, isn't it? He's telling you what he wants to see. Are the possible reasons as to why the ratio has changed? I like the word possible, don't you? There may be many reasons why a ratio has changed, and no one can be certain as to exactly what has happened. All that is required are plausible. Plausible is like believable. 
explanations. Even if they are not the exact answer, marks will be awarded. What a wonderful sentence. I need to underline that. I love that sentence, don't you? The examiner writing to you, the student. With his permission, I've reproduced the article. There is no single correct answer to an interpretation question. Imagine if he's talking about consolidation goodwill. He said, don't worry about it. There's no correct answer. All answers are acceptable, as long as it's believable. Can you imagine how ridiculous that would be? When it comes to consolidation, there's one answer. Goodwill, 7,000. You get it wrong, lose marks. With this sort of topic, interpretation, as long as you suggest something, you'll get enough to pass. So it's very different to most of the rest of the syllabus. That much I can say. Okay. And so I want you to just read a little bit more and picking up a few ideas. So I'm just going to close there. Don't to delay you too much. Clues. Must pick up clues. So where are we? Let's see if I can go back to this. Just to finish off, uh, we made a start on in interpretation analysis. When I see to next week, obviously, we'll finish it off. And today we've picked up some basic and diluted EPS. And when I see you next time, I'll obviously do some more interpretation and then we move on to cash flows. Okay, so that's the plan for next time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we've gone into earnings per share in some detail because it's done quite badly. And when I see you next time, we'll spend time on the interpretation and the last bit we'll spend a few minutes on cash flows maybe half an hour 40 minutes something like that because cash flow is only a small little exercise okay otherwise thank you very much and um, thanks for all your comments etc etc any problems do shout send me emails i always answer them even this morning late last night i can't remember i was sitting down at my emails trying to answer questions it's a great privilege when the student shows interest so use those emails, keep firing questions at me. You must relax about the coming exam. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. All the very best. See you soon. Thank you.